exciting. Um, it's exciting because there are uh, so many uh, sources of uh, information, uh, both visual and, uh, and, and written, about the character. So there's no lack of information about them. Um, half the fun for an actor, of course, is getting a, a sniff of the character, what they're like. And so through, uh, been watching a lot of videos, been reading books, I've also had the opportunity to uh, meet Mr. Nixon in another play. Um, so I had an opportunity to do some research beforehand. And so now the real trick is to make this particular Richard Nixon not necessarily uh, an exact copy of, of the real man, but to integrate it into my own personality and also to take into account the Richard Nixon that is uh, uh, written about in the play. So those are the challenges, and, and it's, a, it's a process whereby you osmose uh, the physical characteristics and the, the speech patterns into the development of it. And there's, there's no plan, really, it just sort of happens over time with the help, of course, of uh, Steve and, and the other actors. In some ways, I think it's a little, and it's not different for Frost, but I think Frost is more significantly different in the play than Nixon is significantly different. Yeah, I think that's true. I, think that's, yeah. I mean, Frost, the David Frost in real life is a is a dynamic figure, but in the play, he's he's kind of hyper theatrical dynamic, and it's a way to try to find a way to honor who he was, who he is. He's still alive, he's still alive. but who he was at that time, but still make him dramatic in the way he exists in the play, because because the play is a dr dramatized version of real life events, and it. It's all kind of hyper-theatrical in a way, and especially Frost, because he's kind of the host of the party. So, because he's much more laid back in real life, and in the play, he's always on. And to try to find a way to create that on that honors who he wa is or was at the time, because he's different now, too. I think, yes, he's, he's slowed down some. Yeah. And, and, and is, he's trying to be more serious. These exactly, days. once he got knighted. Once he got knighted, he got... Very serious. He got very serious, and he was a party boy. <laughs> he was, well, they, we, we, we know in research, it said there was no difference in David Frost from when he was on camera and when he was off camera. It was all the same, right. which is what made him brilliant on camera. Absolutely. There was no different character. And, and the great challenge of the play is then to find the moments, which we just started talking about in rehearsal, the moments where the audience gets to see behind that. And yeah. there aren't many of them, and so to really make them pay off and those are the places where I think he's much closer to the guy that existed in real life. Yes, I think that's true. Yeah, that's yeah very... we're seeing that now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you have to meet the play. We're, do, we're doing the play. The play is a slightly fictionalized account of what happened. Uh, what Peter Morgan has written uh, and it upset David Frost at some point. And as Peter Morgan said, David, it's a play, not a documentary. Uh, because the Watergate section in the play is the last interview. In, re in real time, when these interviews happened in 77, it was the midway point. Uh, so, so we have to meet the play. I remember all this. I read everything. Uh, I, re I remember the news, news report about the break-in. I thought, why is nobody paying attention to this? because it was just ahead of the election uh, that Nixon won in a landslide. So I remember, I remember the time, I remember the paranoia, I remember the Saturday Night Massacre. So that just sort of feeds in depth of what, what was going on at the time. The play has references certainly to all of that, uh, but, we, but our guidepost is the play uh, and, and, and making the play tell the story uh, in, in, a, in a hyper theatrical kind of way. It is. Uh, you should pardon the expression, slightly Brechtian at times, uh, because there's a third person narrator, Jim Reston, whose material, he gave his material, uh, Reston uh, really wanted to clobber Richard Nixon in real life. Uh, and Reston gave, somehow he and Peter Morgan met up, and he gave his, all his writings about this era to Peter Morgan, and Peter Morgan turned it into this play, Frost Nixon. Uh, Peter Morgan seems to be writing a lot about real-time events. He wrote The Queen, wrote The Deal about uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, uh, The Last King of Scotland. Um, he's got another piece about, he wants to write about Blair, Tony Blair and Ed Clinton. And so Peter Morgan's obsessed with time. What he's, and more to your question, 
actually. Uh, I'm going to get there eventually. I'm doing Richard Nixon. <laughs> you know, talk around anything. Uh, is what, what Peter Morgan is, is really concerned about, and, and you see it in the play also, that it's, it's about abuse of power. Uh, and it's about people taking uh, power and, and, and shifting it into, in, into something that is unethical, maybe even criminal. Uh, and, and so I think Morgan would say that that becomes a metaphor for current contemporary day politics. We're not commenting on that, but I, I, it, it certainly is there when listening to Peter Morgan talk about how he sees the world and what he's writing about. I mean, one of the things I think is exciting about the play is uh, some of the parallels that are happening right now in our own time. One of the most shocking lines I say in the play, I think, is uh, he says, if the president does something, it's not illegal. Justifying in his own mind and, and truly in the play, believing this. And you hear uh, that phrase resonating today, perhaps, in what's happening in today's White House. So it's a very exciting play also to not only the event itself of the break-in at Watergate, but why this man and all these people chose to cover it up. And it's fascinating why they did. And I think the play explores some of those things. And I think uh, um, I, I kind of like the musical 1776. One yes. of the great things about the play is we all know the ending. We all know where it's heading. And it, it's a complete surprise, I think. Yes. You know, like in the play, even though we all know what's coming, it's all heading towards this interview. When it finally happens, it, it's... Your, it, your jaw still drops. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, the interesting thing about, about the play also, it, it is not an anti-Nixon play. He actually comes off surprisingly more sympathetic than I think most people would draw a picture of um, and, or think that's what they're going to see in this. Um, but but you, you look at the man suffering, um, in a way, on, on camera, and, and you get behind him in, in, into this little moment, this very quick moment, where he shows us really his soul and how tortured he is. Um, and, and you end up with some, I think, some sense of depth of feeling for him. Well, and I was just going to say, in addition to, I think, kind of an add-on to what Steve was just saying, it. It seems to me, that, and this is another one of the little miracles of the play, and this may or may not be true, but I think the play presents a pretty strong case that nobody besides David Frost could have gotten out of Nixon what he got because of what he was. Partly because Nixon didn't expect it from him, but partly because Frost was such an, at, he was so at ease on the camera and getting people to just be themselves. And yeah. it wasn't a news interview. Like it really was, the shocking thing about watching the real interview is how casual it was, how two guys sitting by a fire it was, you know, how almost hypnotic it was to get Nixon to a place where he felt at ease and finally said what he said. I mean, we, we um, have Reston who narrates the play, says the one thing that I never counted on was finding somebody that knew television. It was about television. This play ultimately, and, and the largest arc is about television and the power of image which we certainly are seeing in the current election cycle, where everybody's worried about how much face time they have, what the image is, what the stage management is of a picture, when it's put on. And this, in 1977, what it was is you had an entertainer and a celebrity in Frost and a politician in Nixon, and Nixon was never comfortable in front of the camera. We know that from the Kennedy debates. Uh, he was always you know, stilted, you know, the famous, uh, seen and laughing, laughing, you know, uh, sock it to me, because he could never get the rhythm right. Uh, but, but what Frost was able to do, <laughs> so every time I see the clip, yeah, you couldn't. Sock it to, to me. me. Sock it to me. Uh, but but what, what Frost was able to do is use the power of television. Frost also had editing control. So they got done with all of this, and it went back to Frost and his people then editing uh, for broadcast. And, and I'll shut up in a second. The interesting uh, statistic, fascinating to me, uh, there was a piece recently in the paper that said Saturday night of the Olympics, when Phelps won his eighth gold medal, the viewership uh, in the States was 39 million people. It was the largest single audience 
viewing a Saturday night show in history. This, this series for Frost and Nixon, in reality, and especially the, the, the Watergate interview, attracted 44 million people, a third of the population of the country, at a time when there were only three networks. So the power of this actually has had more people watching than watching the Olympics on, on that Saturday night. I just find that <laughs> fascinating. Right. Well, we don't want to reveal too much about the play, but there certainly are references in the play and in one very shocking scene in the play about their relationship. And as he said, yes, there is a, there is a, a symbiotic relation between these two men. And uh, if you want to find out what it is, you have to come. You have to come, and come more than once. Yeah. Well, buy more than one ticket. Yeah. Yeah. One, uh, one of the interesting things, I think I told you, uh, I. Frost wrote a book about the interviews. And one of the, I thought one of the most shocking things about the book was the incredible tone of respect for Richard Nixon throughout the book. Like, his level of respect for the man. Because we have a view of Nixon. Right. We have a, through our lens of history and our, our political lens, we have an opinion about him. And it's also partly why Frost was a great guy for the job, because he was a foreigner. He didn't have the same exact lens. But his respect for Nixon's genius, or Nixon's brilliance as a, as a, as a legal mind was immense. And um, it was just a surprise to me and really changed the way I thought about those interviews because they aren't necessarily, and finding a way to have them not necessarily be a way to get somebody, but a way to honor somebody and help them get to a place of honesty. Right, to bring something out. And that, that's right. the brilliance of a good interviewer. Right. The, um, and but both men needed each other. Bo both, both of their careers at this moment were an eclipse. Frost had lost uh, some of his television shows, some of his markets. Nixon, of course, was trying to get back into play and into, into, into contention, uh, maybe back in politics, but certainly back on the world stage. So they both needed each other at this time. So this relationship between the two of them served them both very well, served Frost better than Nixon, ultimately. Well, I just say the, the reason to come to play, uh, see the play is that you're going to find out uh, a lot more about these men and things that might surprise you. It, it's not a parody. It's not a satire. Right. It's, a, it's a real incisive look at these people that you may have met in your life, your early life, or have not met. So for, for those people who have not met either of these gentlemen who were not old enough. It's an opportunity to uh, learn about a very important time in history, and it's also a, a very good opportunity to meet in a very well-written way these, uh, these two men. And one of the, I think one of the great surprises of the play, given the gravity of the subject matter, is what a hugely entertaining yes. it is. Yeah. 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 This, this is it not. It plays like that, a comedy it play, yes. until it doesn't. And, until it, it almost plays like a musical in some ways. Yeah. I mean, it's, very short it's, scenes, and and it's a ten character play, not a two character play. It's right. really important to say that we're not coming to look at two people sitting in two chairs talking to each other. Right. The whole play. There's a whole series of interactions and people. Plus, I mean, and then when we get to the interviews. It's technically complex for us. We are doing live video, so people will see at 12 television monitors in the front of the stage the interviews as they're actually happening on the stage, which is pretty complex for, uh, for us. Uh, but, but, but it's hugely entertaining, and uh, yes, and I think Keith's absolutely right. It is a time in this country that, that I think it's really important we never forget what happened. Um, because it still, it still informs today's politics and, and today's society. There's so much that, that, that current day thinking uh, about how things happen, how things work, hap came out of this time. Mm -hmm. Also, it's a great opportunity to see some of the goofy clothes that I wore and haircuts <laughs> that I had back in the 70s. It's just an incredible period. You know, that's when your clothes would melt rather than that yeah, burn right. because they're made all polyester. Yes, or, 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 or look good next to a nice bowl of sherbet. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The 70s were not stylistically <laughs> genius. No. no.